This Week in Parasitism is brought to you by the American Society for Microbiology at microbeworld.org slash twip. This Week in Parasitism, episode number 75, recorded on July 15th, 2014. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and with me is Dixon Despommier. Hello, Vincent. How are you? I'm very well, thanks. It's kind of soupy outside, isn't it? It is. It's hot and muggy, and it threatens to thunder and lightning this afternoon. That's it for summer in New York City, that's, right? That's right. <laughs> Hot and muggy. We have a special guest today. We do. We it's do. been a while. Very excited about right? this. Yep. She is the director of clinical parasitology and microbiology, initial processing in media labs, associate professor of pathology and laboratory medicine in the division of clinical microbiology at the Mayo Clinic. Wow which is in Minnesota. It is. Bobby Rochester. Pritt. It's in Rochester, Minnesota, as I recall. Bobby Pritt, welcome. Thank you. It's great to be here. Hello, did I Bobby. Have, did I get all your titles right? Yes, you did. <laughs> <laughs> now, I, I we, we hooked up because I think someone told me about you at an ASM meeting. Yes, I believe that's how it all started. Someone came up at a, I think we were doing a live TWIV, and they said, you know, I know this parasitologist that has a, a website called Creepy Dreadful Wonderful Parasite. <laughs> and you should have, and it's okay, we'll get in touch and have her on TWIP. Yep. Yeah, no, it's a pleasure to be here. Great. So, what we'd like to do is find out a little bit about you, how you got to where you are, and so forth. And then we'll talk a little bit about diagnostic parasitology. I don't know if you know Dixon de Pommier. He used to be a parasitologist. He used to be, that's right. Uh. <laughs> Or you once a you're never, you're never not a parasite. <laughs> never right. Not. Once you fall in love with parasites, that's, that's right. it for, for exactly. life. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> and Dixon had a research lab, and you also worked in a diagnostic lab for I many did. years, I right? I began my career in a diagnostic lab. That's right. Oh, well, you did. Excellent. Yeah. Yeah. Bobby, do you know of a parasitologist by the name of Harold Brown? Um, I don't know. Okay. No. no, he's old school. Well, that okay. doesn't mean that you can't know him, right? Dixon? No, that's true. That's true. <laughs> Bobby's very young. Is that what you mean? I do. <laughs> well, no, she's the new generation in parasitology. So oh, well, let's find good. out what that means then. I, I'm dying to find so, out. So, Bobby, tell okay. us where you're from, where you were raised and educated. Yeah, sure. Well, I'm from Vermont. That's where I was born. And um, wow. actually lived in upstate New York for a while, too, which is where my parents still are. And went to undergrad at SUNY Geneseo for biology. Nice. And loved biology. I took a evolutionary parasitology class, which is just awesome. I can't believe they offered that to undergrads, <laughs> and I hope they still offer it. But that kind of really oh. got me interested in this, uh, microbiology and pathology. And of course, with an undergrad in biology, I thought, well, what am I going to do with this? So ended up going to medical school really to become a pathologist so I could study mm. disease and infections. Ah, so you weren't interested in people. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, in the sense that they get infected, Parts and I people. want to prevent that, yeah. and I want to help them. Where did you go so, to medical school? I went back to Vermont, the University of Vermont. That's a great place. Uh, did my medical school there, and then I stayed on at the University of Vermont, and I did a five-year residency in anatomic and clinical pathology. Wow. Yep. And somewhere along the road, I realized that even though tumors and inflammatory conditions were fascinating, I really, really liked infections. And that's right. what I wanted to specialize in. Right. I visited, so that's in Bennington, is that correct? Uh, Burlington. 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 I visited, Beautiful last, city. visited last year in February. Oh, well, that's not when I would recommend to go there. Chilly. I guess unless you're going to go skiing. It was chilly. Right. right. Yeah. But there are a couple of virologists there. They have a microbiology department and... I visited yep. them. It was a nice visit. It's beautiful. You're up at the top of this hill overlooking Lake Champlain with the Appalachian Mountains. So, mm. yeah. So you went to medical school. Adirondack Mountains, sorry. You went yeah, to right. medical school and 
then did, you must did you do a residency afterwards? Yep, that was the residency in pathology. Uh-huh. Um, and then after that, went to Mayo Clinic to do a fellowship in medical microbiology. Nice. Mm-hmm. And there I was really lucky because I started on as a fellow, and they actually had someone retiring who happened to be the director of the parasitology lab. And so I got hired on right out of fellowship. And they said, if you want to be in charge of parasitology, you can go and get more training in this area. And in fact, there's this scholar program and you can pretty much go anywhere you want and get a master's. And um, so I chose to go to London. Nice. So, I nice. know. <laughs> Not a bad hiring package, really. To the so, London School of Yep, I went to the London hygiene. School of Hygiene oh, that's and Tropical fantastic. Medicine. Yeah, yeah that's I got a, great a master's. Place. Great place. Got a master's in medical parasitology. Wonderful. And then um, also did a diploma in tropical medicine and hygiene while I was there. Wow. So I'd get the patient component with global health as well as the parasite component. Fabulous. Nice. Was Jeff Target still there when you were there? Not that I met, no, but okay. there were some great folks there. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. so that's where you learned your parasitology, right? Right, from what I hadn't already learned during mm. residency and my fellowship. Mm. Part of fellowship, you learn about all the different types of bugs, but um, this I get to spend a whole year learning about parasites, That's which was pretty great. fun. That's great. Yeah, great program. Highly recommend wow. it. Wow. And I'm lucky because a lot of my classmates that were there, I think this was part of their career plan, but they didn't really know exactly where they were going from there. Um, sure. I actually got to come back and play with parasites for a career. <laughs> so I so, feel pretty lucky. So then you returned to the Mayo Clinic and yes. took up your current position, which is director of the, the parasitology lab, right? Yeah, and it's a a large clinical diagnostic parasitology lab. Uh, We get specimens all around the from all around the United States. Hmm. So we do over five hundred thousand tests a year. Wow. Um, We see a couple cases of malaria each week. Wow. So this is all through our reference lab because if I was just in Minnesota. Yeah. Right. Right, and you know, cornfields. and <laughs> uh, But the fact that we have specimens coming in from overseas, across the U.S., that's, that's, that's where we get so many. So we have about, yeah, 100 exams, 100 blood smears we do each week, and about 1% to 2% of those are positive. Wow. So you said you have a couple of malaria cases a week. Where are they from? Overseas mainly? Uh, they usually come from people who've traveled overseas but are in the U.S. Mm, so. Right. Missionaries, visitors, people sure. returning home to see friends and family and not taking prophylaxis. Right. And, yeah. So, Bobby, you're, you're the director of the lab. Does it mean you don't get to go in and do anything anymore? <laughs> <laughs> I do once in a while, but it is true. I'm not sitting at the bench all day long doing the actual reading. So, I yeah. have wonderful techs that can sit and do that and look at a microscope all day long. They call me in if they have tough cases. Yep. Uh, they want further guidance. They want some medical history. Uh, I can call up and get more history and try to put the pieces together from a medical standpoint. And then I also get to do the fun or not so fun things of like bringing in new instruments, deciding which instruments sure. to purchase, what tests we're going to run, that sort of thing. So do you, do you do any PCR tests for parasites? Yeah, we have several, and we're starting to, it's kind of sad, but we're, we're replacing yeah. some of our older conventional tests that aren't as sensitive with PCR. Got it. So we have PCR right now for malaria, babesia, toxoplasma. Uh, we're working on one for the free-living amoebae, oh, yeah. so acanthamoeba, neglaria, balamuthia. Sure. And, um, oh, and we just brought in one for trichomonas vaginalis. Nice. So it is kind of sad, you know, it's yeah. fun to see these guys moving right around you. in the yeah, lab. That's right. But it's a better test, so it's better for our patients. Sure. So the uh, traditional tests were micros- microscopy-based, right? Right. You do a wet prep from mm. urine or vaginal secretions for trichomonas, for example. Indeed. And they were kind of neat. They had this jerky movement, so you'd kind of watch them kind of bounce it around the slide. <laughs> and, but not very sensitive. If you don't get the specimen to the lab right away, yeah, right. they die, and then they just look like little blobs of nothing. So... Better to have a molecular test. You detect more cases. Right. So how many people are working in your your laboratory at the moment? Well, in my area specifically, reading parasite cases all day, it's anywhere from five to ten microscopists mm-hmm. sitting wow. at scopes looking at parasites all day long, looking Fantastic. at specimens. Stool and blood, those would be our two big ones. Wow. It can get really busy. We're in our peak because of summer. Mm-hmm. Sure. So we have lots of people traveling doing things like missionary work. 
So coming back with malaria. And then, of course, we have the intestinal parasites. So Giardia, Cryptosporidium, kind of big seasons for that. Right. So tell us, give us a list of what you guys find on a regular basis. Where do we mention malaria a couple of weeks? Uh, what, oh, what yeah. Else? Yep. Well, that's a big one. And then we see some of the uh, non-pathogen, pathogenic protozoa, right. uh, blastocystis, dientamoeba fragilis. I shouldn't call them non-pathogenic. Yeah, exactly. I'm, yeah, there's some <laughs> questions. And actually, defrag probably does yeah, cause yeah, disease. Yeah, yeah. Um, and actually, we also get ectoparasites. And this at this time of day, mm-hmm. or this year, or this time of the year, ticks are huge. Sure. And those are still moving around yep. a lot. Yep. When we get them, yep. so people will have a tick, and then they will go somewhere, and the tick is removed and sent to you. Yeah, it's part of some of the protocols for if you treat the patient prophylactically for Lyme disease, for example. Mm-hmm. So if you know it's an Ixodi scapularis or a deer tick, then the physician can give the patient doxycycline uh-huh. to help prevent them from getting Lyme. Right. Uh, so part of your job, or your technician's job, is to figure out what kind of tick it is. Right. So Mm. part of my job would be to help create those diagnostic keys so that my techs can follow the keys and sit down and figure out what kind of tick it is. Wow. How many different kinds of ticks do you see? (sighs) Two major kinds, but we also... So the two major kinds would be the wood tick, dermacenter species, and Ixodes scapularis, the deer tick. And in Minnesota, they're huge. But then we get the lone star tick, Mm-hmm. Amblyoma americanum, mm-hmm. and it has that little, you know, dot on the back of it, which makes that's right. the lone star. <laughs> so we get some of those from our clients that live down south. Yep. I love how the names flow off your tongue. You know, that was <laughs> <laughs> it sounds better when she says it than when you do. Dixon. Well, you know, I'll, I'll work on that. How's that? But did you know that the lone star disease, the disease they carried, was the first uh, vector-borne disease ever discovered? Really? I yeah, didn't know Theobald that. Smith discovered that. Wow. Way you back. You know, emerging infections, think of ticks. I, exactly. You know, and some viruses. Yep. So for you guys out there with TWIV, but <laughs> <laughs> I would say if you want to study emerging pathogens, think viruses and tick-borne diseases. Here, here. Yeah. So um, uh, don't forget chicken gunya. <laughs> okay, so mosquito <laughs> transmitted mosquitoes. as well. You don't get any mosquitoes to identify. Vector-borne. You know, no, they usually get smushed pretty quick. Yeah. I think wow. people try to smash them and they don't <laughs> save them to send them in. Yeah. But we also get um, we get bed bugs. Yep. People want to know those so they can sure. get exterminators in or sue their landlord or whatever. <laughs> um, we get fleas, lice. Yep. We actually get crab lice, which people tell us really? is going extinct, but not mm. in our hands. We, uh, we've seen, we, we get cases every few months of crab lice. Uh-huh. Hmm. Yeah. Actually, we have an email about lice, which we'll read for you later. We saved it because we didn't know the answer last time. And then you, oh, must, okay. <laughs> you must get a lot of things that are not pathogens that you still have to identify to make yeah. sure that they're not. That would be the majority of what we get, right. actually. Right, like carpet beetles and stuff. Yeah, and then lots of things that people think are worms. Right. But are, are you know, like pieces of undigested food, exactly. like pieces of onion, <laughs> right, tomato right. skin, all sorts of stuff. Yep. So we've gotten pretty good at identifying what partially digested food looks like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, we did here too. I, I actually wanted to run an experiment with our medical students. I, I knew they would volunteer for this, but I never got the permission from IRB. For, for one week, uh, three students each would eat only one thing. You know, like uh, spinach or carrots or celery or lettuce or something else. Of course, you can't live a week on those things. So maybe just make it three (laughs) days and then just look at their stools and see what those artifacts look like. So you could say, oh, and then you could do like forensic medicine. But you know what? That's already been done. So there's Um, a there's a forensic diagnostic manual that actually tells you which fruits and vegetables the victim has been eating. Oh, I wouldn't be surprised when I did forensic <laughs> pathology training. Yeah. yeah, they were big into stomach contents. We always had to like glove up and scoop them out and look at them. That Oof. that always turned my stomach. Oof. I can look at parasites all day long. Yeah, but yeah I hear you. Not stomach contents. <laughs> <laughs> well, speaking of experiments, so I had a technologist who actually we got this stuff in the lab. It was kind of firm and rubbery. It said it they it had been passed in stool, and he thought he knew what it was. So he thought it was chewing gum. 
And I agreed with him. Huh. So he got some gum and chewed it and did that experiment. <laughs> nice. <himself. laughs> Terrific. And was it? <laughs> it was. It looked identical. How cool. You know, I think people forget what they swallow. <laughs> right. That's right. So, so, Bobby, do you are you part of the bigger clinical micro labs or do you have your own parasitology room? Are there bacterial labs or viral labs there as well? There are. Yeah, we're all part of clinical microbiology and we all work together as a group, Mm -hmm. although we have our own dedicated staff and dedicated instruments, but I'm part of the whole of microbiology. So Dixon, when you were working in the lab, how many specimens a year would you do here at Columbia? Well, it it was different because we only took specimens from the hospitals in the local area. We didn't uh, Uh, have specimens from outside, but still, I mean, there were sizable numbers. We had like 50 or 100 per day. Mm-hmm. And in those days, of course, Bobby, you remember uh, we used to have a fresh stool brought to the lab, and then yeah. you got to look at that first, and then you preserve it and do some other things mm-hmm. with it. So we had about six people working in the lab plus a director. Okay. I mean, being so, we're in a special situation, and I recognize that. Mm. I mean, most people, I would say, I guess, aren't lucky enough to have all the parasites. Sure. Well, I guess uh, I'm biased. Uh, but, yeah, we have lab directors for each area of the lab. So we have um, six of us lab right. directors, and we do over 2.4 million tests each year. That's remarkable. Wow. That's, that's almost more than the CDC does. Oh, they do different stuff. Yeah, they're public health testing, some more population-based. Mm-hmm. But, yeah, it's a similar kind of scale. Wow. So, Bobby, why is it that your lab gets samples from all over the world? What what well, what is are you are you are you some international based uh, laboratory? Why is it? Yeah, we have a, a reference laboratory. It's called Mayo Medical Laboratories. Mm-hmm. So people, uh, laboratories that can't do certain types of testing, send that t- testing to us. So unfortunately, I think we're seeing it these days. The technologists that have all those really good skills, they're retiring. Uh-huh. So a lot of, of smaller labs, they don't have people that can read stool specimens, That's ovun right. parasite exams. So we do a lot of ovun parasite exams for people who just don't have that expertise anymore. Right. And then, I- of course, PCR tests more esoteric, specialized test that yep. maybe it doesn't make sense for another lab to do, hmm. they send it to us. Are it's you competitors with uh, Quest Labs by any chance? Yes, we so are. My, my former wife actually was the ah. director of the parasitology group there for many oh, years. Oh, wow, okay. And yeah. she, she had like 10 people working for her. She was really good at what she did, too. Yeah, I mean, we are colleagues with uh, folks at Quest, LabCorp, the other large reference labs, ARUP. So we think of ourselves as colleagues, but I guess in a business sense, yeah, yeah we'd be, right, right. be competitors. <laughs> and, and how do you guys uh, think about the proficiency tests that are sent to you from various sources? Well, I have to admit I have a hand in those proficiency ah. tests. So um, I'm on the College of American Pathologists oh, at nice. uh, the Microbiology Resource Committee, okay. and we come up with those um, oh, proficiency <laughs> tests, always working to get them better. Uh, you know, one of the biggest problems with PT or proficiency testing mm. is getting material to yeah, send right, to right, exactly. 5,000 labs, for you example. Bet, you, bet. you know, you see something cool and you think, oh, I could use this for a PT exam. Right. But then you think of the scale of, okay, well, you'll need 5,000 of those various <laughs> slides to send to everyone. So uh, CAP actually doesn't have a lab. They contract with people, usually in developing countries, and then they collect human specimens and send those. I'm I'm asking Dixon what CAP is. Well, it's an organization that oversees the uh, the the uh, certification of laboratories. What does it stand for? College of American Pathologists. Got it. Yeah. You go. Now you had, you mentioned before that you're a reference lab, and that also some of these commercial labs are reference labs. Are there other academic medical centers that serve as reference labs in the U.S.? Well, every I would say most academic labs sort of have a little outreach. I see. So um, they might test the patients at their local hospital, but then they might test uh, specimens coming in from other parts of the state. Right. So in Vermont, where I did my training, Fletcher Allen Healthcare, they served as a reference lab for northern Vermont, southern Vermont, and even parts of northern New York State. Right. right. So we all kind of as academic centers have a little bit of an outreach, but you always kind of need a reference lab. And even we as a reference lab, we have a reference lab for things we don't do. (laughs) You know, there's always things that you're just not going to do at your place that you'll send to someone else. Sure. So what kind of a test would you be unable to do, for example? Uh, 
Well, some tests are actually patented, so we can't do them here legally. Mm. So we have to send them to specialty labs that do those tests. That would be a good example mm. where we're just bound by legal issues. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned before that PCR is beginning to be introduced in the parasitology labs. Is this replacing microscopy? Well, for some things, yes. Mm -hmm. So the trichomonas vaginalis, uh, we did away with that test because we knew clinically it just wasn't as good. It has a sensitivity of 30 to 50 percent compared to like 90 to 100 percent for molecular testing. Mm. But for other things, no, I think we still have a role for microscopy. Mm -hmm. uh, so for an example, there's these two new molecular panels that were just FDA approved, GI panels. And they test for all these bacteria, viruses, and they happen to have some parasites, Giardia, Cryptosporidia, and one of them also has Cyclospora and Entamoeba histolytica. Mm -hmm. But that's still only four parasites. Right. And so if the patient traveled abroad, you think they have helmets, it's obviously not gonna detect something if it doesn't have specific probes and primers for that organism. Mm -hmm. So I think you're always going to need some skills. I think our challenge is going to be going forward is how do you maintain those skills when you only have to call upon them once a month or, yeah. you know, a limited amount of time. Sure. So what's it's the, like that old saying, how do you get to Carnegie Hall? And the answer is practice. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. And if you don't see the stuff over and over again, you don't you you lose proficiency. Exactly. So, what we'll probably do for some of these things is we we'll, we will always maintain one, two, three technologists who remain mm -hmm. really good mm -hmm. at a certain area. And so maybe we don't have all of our techs in our lab. There's actually in my area there's 44 technologists who could wow. read parasites even though there's only 5 to 10 at any one time. So you can imagine trying to keep 44 people competent in yeah, reading, you yeah. know, a certain Tough. type of exam. Yeah. So do they all participate in the uh, proficiency exam at least so they can oh, see Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they do. And they all have to undergo annual competency on right. all the different areas they do. So it's pretty rigorous. How often do you do a proficiency test? Well, you subscribe to them, and mm. it depends whether the government considers it a regulated analyte or not. And if it's regulated by them, that means that you have to do so many per year. Right. So there might be three times a year that we look at blood smears, for example. Mm -hmm. So aside from PCR, are there any other technologies that are coming into the parasite lab? I know, for example, in clinical micro, you know, the Malditoff is a big deal now, right? Yeah. I would love to use Malditoff. I think it would be great. Could you explain that for the uh, non-science yeah. <laughs> listeners like myself? Malditoff? Sure. What is a Malditoff? Well, it sounds like a drink that you'd order at some tropical bar. <laughs> It's matrix, so MALDI, uh, let me see if I get this right, matrix-assisted uh, laser desorption ionization, that's MALDI, and then the TOF is time of flight. Okay, so then breaking this down into terms that we can all understand, <laughs> um, essentially you scoop up usually bacteria or a fungus, a yeast, mold, and you um, mix it in a matrix, hence the matrix part of MALDI, mm. and then you zap it with a laser, and that... Uh, ionizes it into all these little particles. The fact that you put it in a matrix means it kind of protects it so you don't like totally fry it into nothing. Um, so you zap it with a laser, it forms all these tiny little particles, and then you basically suck it up this big tube and the TOF, the time of flight, that just measures how long it takes each of those little particles to get from one end of the tube to the other. Oh. So if they're small particles, they travel faster. If they're large particles, they travel slower. And every time a particle hits the end of the tube, it creates a little signal. And then it gets put into this computer, which basically analyzes it all. It compares the signal to a database and then it says oh that's the signal for uh oh, salmonella yeah, it's yeah. very cool <laughs> it's very cool but what you need to do this is you need to be able to have an impure culture and mm. you need a ah. yeah so where you can grow bacteria or a yeast on a plate and then gotcha, scoop some of it up gotcha. and put it in this matrix okay. yeah we okay. don't usually grow parasites in the lab mm. and when we uh -huh. do we actually tend to grow them in either human cells or um, 
like I'm trying to think of something like acanthamoeba will grow acanthamoeba or strongyloides, although we don't really, in my lab, we don't grow it. Mm, mm. We'll put it on a stole auger culture, but right. that's really just growing the bacteria exactly. and the, the larvae just kind of swarm around and drag the bacteria with them. Mm. So you end up with this mess of bacteria, stool yes. bacteria. <laughs> so it's too complicated. <laughs> the instrument can't figure it out. Right. So really you have to get it pure. So some of the ways people are going around that is using PCR first to kind of isolate the DNA, and then you can put that into a time-of-flight device. But now you've taken Malditoff, which is pennies per reaction, and you've turned it into PCR, essentially, into a complex and expensive reaction. Hmm. So for the moment, it's simply PCR that is changing things in the parasitology lab, right? Yeah. I mean, there's some cool technologies out there using um, essentially nucleic amplification that doesn't require PCR. Mm -hmm. So you don't need the temperature to go up and down, that thermal cycling. Mm -hmm. Um, You could do it at the same temperature. So that means you could potentially do this in sub-Saharan Africa where there's not electricity. And you could run a little instrument off of solar panels. So people are doing some really neat stuff on how to diagnose things in the field. Mm. Um, Not a lot of that's translated into clinical use in a a lab in the United States. I, I, um, I was just at a meeting where people were discussing ways to make very cheap diagnostics for these areas that don't have I mean, a lot of healthcare infrastructure. And they basically involved, um, you know, taking some serum and putting it on a matrix of some sort and getting a reaction, a band test, or a, a, re- a pattern that you could read on a yeah. QR reader that would make a pattern that can then be transmitted electronically so there's no errors. And it's really amazing the progress that's being made in terms of, for example, dengue diagnostics, HIV diagnostics. Mm-hmm quick, rapid, in-the-field tests that are inexpensive and don't require electricity. Right. It's yeah. really remarkable. That's really being used a lot in uh, malaria diagnosis. Mm-hmm. Rapid diagnostic tests, which, like you said, they're um, a little strip test right. with right. little antigens impregnated in that little strip, and then you add the patient serum, and if there's antibodies, Bingo. they'll bind to the antigen. and yep. Or sometimes it's the antibodies and then it's the antigen you're adding. Either mm-hmm. way, mm-hmm. it creates a band. So there's one of those in the U.S. that's FDA approved mm-hmm. for malaria. But uh. worldwide, I would say there's hundreds. Of course, these are for the field. And you would st- in your lab, you would always use the, the state most of the art. state of the art, whatever sure. it is, because you can do it, right? Yeah, we do, but it's not to say that it's not useful in a smaller lab. So Mm -hmm. say it's two in the morning and, you know, malaria is potentially life-threatening. A patient comes into the emergency room. They have a travel history to sub-Saharan Africa. Mm -hmm. They're worried that they have malaria. Who's going to read that smear if you're going to do blood smears? So that would be a situation where in a smaller lab Mm -hmm. uh, where we don't have where you don't have people you can call in that are experts, um, you might do one of these rapid tests. The tests aren't perfect, but they're pretty good at detecting really high levels of Plasmodium falciparum, which is the the species that's going to kill you in, Mm. you know, a few hours. So at really high levels like that, it's good at detecting that. But in your your case... We don't. Yeah. You don't do it. So are there situations where someone comes in to the ER and, and you have to send a tech in to read something or that doesn't happen? Sometimes we do that, but we also have uh, fellows. We have three <laughs> <laughs> trainees. Yeah. Those so three, three lucky clinical microbiology <laughs> fellows that are doing a one or two year training program and they carry a pager 24-7. Wow. So. And then, of course, we always have people like me. I can come in in the middle of the night. We have our technologists who can come in if need be. Mm -hmm. But we provide them training. They have to pass an exam, and then they're deemed competent to come in and read these smears. Mm -hmm. So you're training the next generation of diagnostic parasitologists. Exactly. It's good experience for them. I mean, there's nothing like being at 2 in the morning in a lab by yourself, putting yourself on the spot. I mean, you can study study sets. You can go through study sets all you want and flip the card over and look at the answer, that sort of thing. (laughs) But it's a completely different story when you're there by yourself and you have to make that first call. Even if you know you have backup, you know that it's your responsibility to make that first call. And that's just such a a great 
valuable learning experience. Sure. You yeah. know, you'd be surprised to learn that while I was teaching here, and I taught from 1971 to, to 2009, we um, instructed the students, second-year medical students, on how to do a right stain and make oh. a good blood smear. Because just as what you said was true, I mean, they could find themselves uh, at 2 o'clock in the morning as a third-year yeah. student under the tutelage of some clinical pathologist. And the yeah. medical student actually turned out to know a lot more than the clinical pathologist <laughs> because they didn't train wow. at Columbia. <laughs> so they'd never wow. seen it they before. Got, they got trained under you. And yeah. Well, or, or <laughs> under someone like me. So that's why we asked you if you knew Harold Brown because Harold Brown started this course back in 1948. Oh, wow. And it was contiguous. It's still going on now. Somebody else is teaching it, but uh, I don't think they're using microscopes anymore to teach with, and so I think that's really sad. Yeah. Mm -hmm. From my perspective, it's sad. Dixon, what's a right stain? A right stain is a quick Giemsa stain. Mm -hmm. It's a a stain which differentiates cytoplasm from nucleus of uh, a blood smear. Mm-hmm. And it, it also differentiates the nucleus of the uh, malarial parasites. So they're easy to see, basically, and they're quick. And the Giemsa stain is not quick, but the right stain is pretty foolproof, and you can run one in a couple of minutes, basically, uh, and get an answer. And the answer, well, leads you to the treatment, obviously. So if you don't have a diagnosis and you think the patient is suffering from malaria anyway, I, I know people that have actually started treatment. Uh, even though the diagnosis was not made. And uh, they've uh, erred in a lot of cases because lo- all the fevers that come into the hospital are not necessarily malaria. Hmm. You know, that's a great point, too, because you probably have heard of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and oh, sure. the Wellcome Trust oh, sure. and all of these great international organizations that are working on eradicating malaria. Yep. Now, I have to admit, I don't know if we, with our existing tools, we can't eradicate malaria but if we create new tools we might be able to but what we're doing really well right now is controlling and eliminating malaria from certain areas and as you get rid of malaria the people that come in with fevers are going to be more and more likely to have something else sure like lhasa or ebola or something right exactly Uh, chikungunya (laughs) so getting that diagnosis right right. you can't just throw malaria drugs at everyone no you can't and if you do that of course you'll create resistance and that's well exactly that's what's happened isn't it Mm -hmm. so tell me what are the main bodily fluids or objects that you would use for diet? I, I understand blood would be one in stool. Are those yep. the main ones? Those are the main ones, but of course you can get parasites in any part of the body. I guess that's one of the things that makes it so fascinating. Sure. Um, so anything really. We could get liver abscess, brain uh, brain material, brain abscess, CSF yeah. for neglaria, yeah, you know, yeah. the so-called brain-eating amoeba, um, duodenal aspirates, you name it. Oh, skin scrapings for of scabies. Course, course. Hmm. That's a, a fairly common thing that we get. Right. So it depends on the symptoms that are presented to the initial clinician, what kind of sample they're going to take, right? Exactly. And sometimes, unfortunately, they just check off all the boxes yeah. uh, and they say, That's oh, right. I want, you know, I have a piece of big toe and I want to test this for bacteria, parasites, fungi, and viruses. <laughs> and you're kind of thinking to yourself, all right, the guy has a rash on his big toe. It's probably not a parasite. It's probably right. not a virus. <laughs> <laughs> but <Sadly> we, <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> but we have an idea of what could possibly be in the big toe. I mean, sure. there are, in fact, there's the sand well, flea that will actually burrow into your your big toe so we usually try to get some history on those and try to figure out (laughs) are you really looking for a parasite or did you just you know check all the boxes bobby you'd be amused to uh, listen to some of the telephone calls that i got from residents while i was still teaching and one of the more remarkable ones that i got was uh is this dr tapamian i said yes he says well this is one of your former students he says i have a gentleman here from ghana and he claims that he's got a worm in his eye. What should I do? And I oh, said, wow, I said yeah. take it out. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> he says, you mean he could have a worm in his eye? I said, take oh, a closer yeah. look. It's Loa it Loa. Cute. And indeed, he did have one. And indeed, he did take it out. So, Oh, wow. That's a great story. That was terrific. You have know. you ever seen Loa Loa, Bobby? Uh, you know, I've seen it in a lot of biopsies. Yep, I've seen it in blood smears. I've seen the adult worm when they've taken it out and submitted Ooh. that. We don't get a lot of that here. Right. It all depends on where you're practicing and where you tend to get immigrants from. Sure. How about toxoplasma? Wait, wait I want to get... go back to that just for a minute. Oh, yes. Yeah. Vincent, Vincent, where do you think that was discovered? Which? Loa Loa. 
in in your lab? I don't know. Scotland. Scotland. Yes. I wouldn't have guessed. <laughs> Sir Robert Did Argyle. No, no. His uh, his housemaid had come from uh, Calabar. Oh my! Along the, along the southern uh, western coast of Africa, and in fact, it's known as Calabar swelling. Yep. And she had two worms, and one turned out to be a male, and the other turned out to be the female. Oh wow! So he removed the worms hmm. and described their their morphology hmm. so in Scotland. Huh. <laughs> so you never know where these <laughs> things are going to turn up, right? Oh, you never know. You uh, in Minnesota, you might not know this, but we have the largest Somalian immigrant population wow. in the U.S. Hmm. So I mean, we have large okay. immigrant populations even in small or well, sure. you know, somewhat rural states. Yep. So do you see a lot of toxoplasma? Toxo, we see more of, although not in my lab so much. Mm. That's usually diagnosed mm. by serology, and that's done in the infectious disease serology lab. Okay. So we kind of deal with things we can see, the morphology, the right. microscopy, um, and the PCR. But there, we have another lab that does all the antibody testing. Do you get a lot of uh, referrals from your own hematology lab from technicians that say, I saw something funny on this blood smear. Could you help me out? Or, or they actually know what it is? <laughs> yeah, sometimes. Um, or they'll send a specimen to hematology and to us. Right. So, yeah. But no, we just actually recently had a, a case of babesiosis. Of course, you know, it's the season wow. for it. Wow. So, and I think that was discovered initially in hematology, and then they sent their slides right. to us. Right. Because, of course, they're similar enough we can read them. Uh, our diagnostic lab has the virtue of hiring people who have had experience already in the tropics. A lot of our technicians are from Jamaica, for instance, and from Trinidad. Oh, wow. And they've already had this training about this is normal and this is probably a parasite of some sort. And so they've, ah. had, to, they've had to become proficient in both of those things. So, well, that's really neat background yeah, we lucky. training there. We were lucky. Yeah. yeah. I'm not sure if that's still the case. but uh. mm. So, Bobby, are there any parasitology meetings that you go to? I would say, well, there's a number out there. Uh, a lot of them, even though they're really good, some of them are more um, basic science kind mm. of things where people are studying like receptors and uh, very specific chemical pathways. Mm. I tend to really go to the ones that have the clinical impact. Mm -hmm. So my favorite meeting for parasites is the American Society of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene annual meeting. Right. And I usually uh, give a course there on parasites or I give a lecture on parasites. Uh, but you said you mentioned ASM, I think, and mm -hmm. they have a decent amount of parasites there. Actually, I gave a talk on parasites there while I was last at ASM. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah, those would be, I think, the two big ones. And of course, you know, there's other infectious disease conferences where they cover a little bit of parasites. Yeah, right. But I think viruses really and bacteria are in the spotlight more. Yeah, right. So I wanted to talk a little bit about your blog or website called oh, Cre yeah. Creepy Dreadful Wonderful Parasites, <laughs> A Parasitologist's View of the World. How long have you been doing this now? Since 2007. Wow. So what was the, uh, it, what made you get going on this? What was the idea? Well, you know, um, I had done something like this as a pathology resident, but just for uh, tumors and other things I was learning. So when I, in 2007, realized I was going to go to London for the year, I was leaving behind some colleagues that I thought would like to see some of the cool cases that I was going to be seeing. So I, I really started the blog as a way to share cases with the folks back home. But then when I graduated, I had all these folks from London, and they wanted to start seeing my cases. And now the next thing I, I know, I have, uh, I mean, it's pretty cool. I, I have 10,000 to 14,000 hits a month. And Outstanding. That's good. I, and I have people from Pakistan and India, Finland, that's Philippines. That's so it's really blossomed into something that I never would have expected. Well, that's what cool. the internet does. That's, of course, what we found with TWIV and TWIP and TWIM. And that you get yeah. people who you never thought would be interested and that's right. they're engaged. So you, these are images from your laboratory. Is that right? Yep, and um, and there and you put them up and say here here is uh, well for example the case of the week three hundred and eleven so that's your three hundred and eleventh case that you've posted. Yes, the following were seen on ova and parasite exam performed on an adopted child from Ethiopia, and then you ask them to identify it. Do you right? know what they are, Vincent? I was going to ask Dixon to go through a few <laughs> of these and see if he could do it. So what well, is that, Dixon? You know, I'm sure Bobby knows that I know what that is. So. <laughs> well, that's, I, I, will, I will tell you what it is. Yeah, the big one with the uh, rough edges on the outside is an ascaris egg. It mm -hmm. is, yeah. And the other one that looks like a football because it has two little pores yeah. at either end, that's Trichuris, Trichura. Wow, two exactly. of them in one. 
two yeah. in one. It's not unusual to find a patient so with multiple parasites. Where did this okay. specimen come from? Well, this was actually in my archives. Mm -hmm. So um, what I try to do is I put up a case every week. Uh, as we were saying, it's it's a case of the week, an unknown case. And I don't give very much clinical history, obviously, to mm. protect the patients. It's really just here's some images, a little background so they know where the patient's from. And then... Um, so, and then people write in with their answers. So it all depends if I have something really cool that came up in the lab that week. I'll go in and take pictures. I'll take videos. I like to embed videos whenever I can. Nice. Um, but if I don't have anything, which was the case this week, I went through my archives and I found an older case. Huh. So look, I'm looking at the comments here. Everybody got it right. Yeah. And you know, I Pretty love... Good. I, one of the really unexpected benefits is, well, I've met all these, you know, fellow parasitologists that are like-minded and like creepy crawly cases, um, but then they've met each other through this, and right. it's not uncommon to see them commenting on each other's posts and yeah. saying, oh, yeah, so-and-so is right. I didn't even notice that, and Good I just stuff. think that's cool. It's like a little uh, chat yeah. room that I never even expected. Exactly. So you're going to get even more people visiting after you're on TWIP here will yeah. we'll tell people where to go. Oh, that would be great. I want Dixon to look at some of the others and happy and I, and also explain to me. So case 310, a stool agar. That one was a hard one. Yeah. Stool agar culture plate. <laughs> so what is this? You take the stool and you just put it on an agar plate? You do. And um, the bacteria that are in the stool, mm -hmm. they're just basically innocent bystanders. And then if there happens to be strongyloides in the stool, right. they will crawl out across the plate and they'll drag the bacteria with them. Yep. Uh -huh. And as they drag it, you know, the bacteria grows in these little paths, which kind of alerts you to think, hmm, bacteria doesn't usually grow in little sinuous exactly. snake-like paths. Exactly. So then we put it under the microscope and take a look and see if we can find often we find a crawling little worm in there. This case actually though, case 310, was a reminder that other things can move in a stool exam. Mm. And in this case, it was actually a, an odd bacillus species that was kind of moving in this really weird circular pattern. And it kind of looked like a worm. Uh -huh. It threw us off a little. So sometimes I put trick cases in there. <laughs> um, in fact, I felt a little bad uh, having that trick case. So this week I put an easier case and a uh, I don't know if you noticed some of the comments. They were like, phew, finally I got one. <laughs> so they're like, thank you for the easier case. So, so yeah. This stool piece of stool is just sitting on the auger? Because it looks like there's yeah. something over it. Maybe it's just a reflection on the top of the plate. It's just sitting on the we, auger, right? Yep, it's just sitting on the auger. We put the Petri dish lid on and we tape it shut. I see. Because I don't know if you know about strongyloides, but mm -hmm. the larvae, they're microscopic, and they can crawl through intact human skin. So they could get out of they could get out yes. of the plate and in, yeah I think you mentioned that once. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's right. So I don't think you really want. So we um, only handle these with gloves and we tape them that's up right. and then that's right. usually we put them in a plastic bag and look through the bag itself as right. well. Right, right. What is the brown bar that is next to the stool piece there? The brown bar. Uh, hold on, I'll take a look. It's a rectangular bar of some. Oh, that's the uh, type of media, and it's upside down. I and see. if you were to label. flip the, it just would just tell you it, this is a beef broth media. So mm -hmm. essentially, it has lots of nutrients, so the bacteria will grow nicely on it. Mm -hmm. So this is a specific uh, test for strongyloides because it it carries the bacteria away from the stool piece, right? It's a test we do for strongyloides, so it's but it's semi-specific in that. Anything that's on there that's moving right. around mm. can also do this. So like um, in the mycology lab, you never want to have mites in your lab. They get into your auger plates and they crawl sure. all over. Sure. We, we could get mites in these and they'd crawl all around. Um, also, hookworm eggs would eventually hatch and then you'd get little larvae crawling around. Right. So it's a, it's a good way to... Notice that something's moving around, sure. And then you have to put it under the microscope and figure out what right. exactly is. And that would around. tell if you looked at it, then you could tell what of these options are the real one. You could tell if it was strongyloides or something else, right? Yeah, exactly. Sometimes you need to get in there. We are really careful. We put it in the um, the hood in a biosafety cabinet mm -hmm. and right. try to actually remove the worm and put it on a slide because sometimes you really need to study it under. 100x with oil sure. magnification. So you also did some gram stains here yep. uh, from the edge. And then 
um, you say at the end, identification suggested further workup. So what, what other workup would you do in this case? Well, in this case, we actually did some workup on this just for fun. Um, we actually did Maldi-Toff on ah. it <laughs> to prove that it was a bacillus species. <laughs> so this was really just a big filamentous bacteria that you could see under just using a 10x objective. And it had this kind of odd motility. So we have to remember right. that it's not just worms that move. Right. You know, bacteria have uh, their own motility as well. Sure. Okay, Dixon, case number 309, the following yes. structure seen in a refrigerated urine specimen. Well, uh, bells go off in my head when I hear about urine because that just <laughs> tells me about only a couple of things. And if it's a preserved specimen like this might be. Although not, it looks like a, a live specimen. Uh, this would be schistosoma hematobium. That's exactly what it is. I just want to see if Dixon is really a parasitologist <laughs> or if he's been so if fooling me all on, these years. If you click on the images, they get bigger. And you can see in the middle of, go to the second image, you'll see these little eggs with that little poke out, oh, pokey yeah. spine at one end, like a little steeple. Right. So very characteristic for this particular parasite, which is a pretty nasty parasite. It um, is lives in the venous plexus, so the veins around your bladder, and um, the female produces these eggs, which go through the wall of the veins, into the wall of the bladder, and then into the urine, right. and then they get excreted. The problem is, is that most of them don't get into the urine, they just get stuck in the bladder wall, right. and then it, it creates all this inflammation, and, and your you know urine turns red from all the blood, and, and it can even lead to bladder cancer. Indeed. So, an important thing to detect and treat. So, Vincent, what do you think those other circular things are there with the little dense centers? Because um, that, that would throw off unexperienced microscopists. I don't know what yes. they are. They would be tempted to call that a parasite. No. Right. I, I don't know what so it is. So, how, how could you tell that it's not a parasite just by looking? So, you don't know what it is. But, I don't. But what is, what is one of the characteristics that you see right away when you look at them? They're regular. Ah, but are they all the same diameter? No, there's some smaller ones and some right, bigger ones. Right, that's exactly right. So you start off by saying, hmm, this doesn't look like an organism, or if it is, there are two of them. One is small and one is mm -hmm. big, but then you see intermediate sizes also. So you start looking around there and you say, eh, that's, I, I've never seen a parasite that looks like that before. I don't know what stage that could be. It could be a cyst of some sort. Uh, it's perfectly round, mm -hmm. so it's got to be something. So, uh, Bobby, what do you think it is? Well, so, yeah, I agree. These are crystals. They're probably uh, ah. calcium carbonate, but I'm not exactly sure. Uh -huh. uh, <laughs> but I, that's a really good point because, like you said, probably more often than not, I get things that aren't parasites. Right. Actually, if you go to case 41... I have a picture of some crystals that look a lot like schistosoma hematobium oh eggs. If oh you just wow. type in the 41. <laughs> right. And, but it was all those things that Dixon just said is they're different sizes. Yeah. They also, I don't know if you noticed, they're pointed on both ends uh, instead of just one yeah, end. Sure. And if you scroll down um, for the answer, I describe that the... Um, I, I show a real egg next to a crystal and the real oh, egg only idea. has a point at one end. Perfect. Yeah, so you learn these little tricks as you get good at recognizing right. parasites, and then you think, well, that's not a parasite that I've ever seen before. Exactly. Let me look into that further. <clears throat> and also, I'm amazed at all the debris in urine. Oh, yeah, especially if it's been refrigerated. A lot of times, ah, um, the crystals yeah. tend to form. Sometimes we'll heat the urine up a little bit to mm. dissolve the crystals sure. and better see the eggs. Sure. And sometimes you can actually see the the stage inside the egg moving around, right? Yes, which is very cool. So very it's called a cool. mericidium. I used to and love it has, that. Oh, so the really neat thing, um, which I'm going to have to do the next case we get, is you put it in tap water, yes. the eggs, yes. and the eggs will hatch. It's That's actually right. called the hatch test. Exactly. And the little mericidium that has cilia around it will right. swim out, Right. which is very fun. Right. So, Dixon, you game for a couple more? Absolutely. Go to number 308. This case, uh, a 85-year-old woman, rash on her scalp, so scrapings were obtained. What do you see there, Dixon? I see, I see things that are empty that used to be full. You have to talk into the mic, Dixon. I'm trying to do both. I know, it's hard. <laughs> Look at the second.
second image. There's I'm looking some, uh, at the second image. Okay. There's, there's one of those things that came from one of those empty structures. Yes, indeed there is. But this case has a trick. Because uh, there's uh, two things this there. This looks like Demodex Folicularum. At the top of the screen is Demodex Folicularum. Right. But at the bottom of the screen... Oh, I see um, it. I see it. Yep. It's scabies. It, it's there's a scabies, scabies mite. Right. So this was really cool. Um, two things in one. One's considered kind of a, a harmless commensal. In the, and yeah, you probably don't want to know this, but most of us have <laughs> little parasites living in our hair follicles. They're symbionts, Which is please. The one They're on, symbionts. This is the one on the top of the, of the yeah. end. Yep. What's right. that yep, called little, again? Demodex or Demodex. Everybody yeah. has those. Folicularum. Well, it's like up to 80% of the population. By the time you get older, uh, most people have them. I probably okay. got lots of them then. And the second one is scabies uh, mite, scabies. you said. Which one is that, the second image? No, no, you can the... see the empty eggs at the bottom. Those are the scabies eggs I in see. the top image. But in the second image, there's a little mite. And if you click on the image, it gets a little bigger and you can see that mite. Huh. So this case was donated from one of my readers, Florida mm. fan. Mm. And um, again, that's one of the great things that's come up from this blog is this community of readers. And then they donate cases. Yep. That's, yep. That's and I, I should mention that I actually have a reader who also donates poems. <laughs> Nice. If he feels particularly inspired, he will write a poem to uh -huh. go with one of my cases. Nice. Yeah, so All right, I always post those with the answer. He's, go to the bottom. He's unconvinced. No, I'm, I just like to hear you. Where? Uh, it says older, po <laughs> older posts at the bottom there. Yeah. And the next one is uh, the following were recovered from a wound. And submitted to yep. the laboratory for identification. This is pretty. This is fun, Dixon. There you oh, go. Oh yeah, I like that. Are you clicking on the video? Yum. Uh, the video below, Dixon. Here, let's see. Click yeah. on that video. Yeah. Now, this is you cool. You can the sound on it. Those are little yeah. maggots, Vincent. <laughs> oh, they're. Yeah. Look at that. That's amazing. Yep. Are they? So, are they debriding the wound and helping out here? So that's actually what these were. Yeah, these are medical maggots. Excellent. Wow. Um, and in this case, they were actually purposefully put in the wound. Cool. <clears throat> and this particular <laughs> type of maggot only eats dead tissue, which right. is great. Right, uh, right. Some of them will eat living tissue, so obviously you don't want to use those. Exactly. Um, so we were given these by the company um, that sells medical maggots because I was teaching medical students and I wanted to have a really good ah, that's demonstration. Wonderful. That's wonderful. And they really kindly <laughs> donated these to us. Normally they're about $150 for a little um, vial of these. They come impregnated in a gauze and this is a little gross, but you take the gauze and you just put it right on the wound and then you wrap it up in bandages so that no one has to look at it and you just let the maggots do their thing. Oh, how long do you let that go for? You know, I'm not exactly sure, but they do give warnings in the package insert that comes with it that if you let them there for too long, they'll crawl out of the gauze. Right. I was going to ask, do they freak out the nurse and the patient? But do, do the patient <laughs> does the patient feel the maggots crawling around as well? <laughs> You know, I'm not sure, but yeah. I think once they start getting out of the wound and That's you get it. into, like, <laughs> innervated skin, then yeah, yes. Yeah. In the wound itself, there may not be sensation, depending. This is good for cool. patients that are, like, diabetics that have right. wounds where they just don't, they don't have a lot of sensation down there and they don't have a lot right. of blood flow. Right. And it actually does a better job than we do yes. with surgeons debriding the wound. Hmm. The maggots are more thorough. Neat. You know, this was discovered during wartime. Mm-hmm. Way back when. <laughs> they used it during the Civil War a lot, actually. Let's do one more, Dixon. This, you, you need to know, 306, uh, the case, uh, finding during colonoscopy, uh, it was an incidental finding. I'm looking at it. You see All that? right, this one's a little tough because it's a H and E, a hematoxylin right. and eosin histopathology image. And you've got sections of this also, this object. Yes. So I would what helps? Oh, go ahead. No, 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 no. I, no, no. <laughs> you want the, the instructions? I can get. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the helpful hint is in the very first image. Um, on the right hand side is a rather large caliber longitudinal section of a worm, and on the left hand side of the image are very are smaller caliber longitudinal sections. And I'll tell you, this is the same worm, so it has thin areas and thick areas. Thin and thick. With no rigid outer cuticle. Right. And no, looking at the cross sections at least, no apparent gut tract. Not Although, from what it's shown. There are some stickosomes oh, present. Oh, stickosomes. So irregular shaped, 
irregular diametered worm. And if it's a helminth, of course, then this could probably be Trichurus. Exactly. Yeah. Good. Good so, <laughs> and people always, um, you know, they look at the whipworm, Trichurus trichura, uh, right. commonly known as the whipworm, and they think that because there's a fat end and a skinny end, that the skinny end must be the tail. Right. But you all know that it's the opposite. Correct. It's the skinny end that is the head that yes. embeds. But, you know, it makes sense because the skinny end, if you had to embed something into an intestinal wall, would you do it with a skinny needle or a big, thick, right. blunt in- implement? Well, <laughs> so it makes sense that it's the skinny end sure. that embeds. And then the big fat end is usually filled with eggs, right. and that just hangs out in the gut and drops yep. all the eggs into the stool. Yep. Well, so, I, I spent nice. um, 28 years trying to figure out what the stickocyte cells do. Oh, because I, I worked on chicken exactly? elephant. Well, uh, and they—that's <laughs> a very great question. Of course, <laughs> <laughs> I wish we could yeah. answer that question. Um, they share those with with trichinella. They do. You're in right. fact, yeah. the, the trichurata—that's all of the yep. worms that uh, in that family of worms. They all have the same structure, but trichinella has something different than trichurus, and that is that as a larva. When they live in the muscle tissue, they have one kind of stichosome, which has five different kinds of cells that comprise it. And the adult worm, when it develops in your gut tract, has stichosomes also. And the stichocyte cells of that stichosome are all of the same kind. So the cells undergo transformation from a larva to an adult in trichinella. I don't know what the larval stages of trichurus look like in terms of its own stichosome, but I know that the adult uh, stichosome, which is a Greek term for row of cells, by the way. (laughs) So it's not very descriptive. (laughs) They're very descriptive. Uh, Those cells share a lot in common with the adult stage of trichinella, and they both live intra-multicellularly. They live in the body of the cell. They don't just penetrate the cells. They live in conjunction with it. So this worm creates a syncytium of cells, which actually stay alive during the life of the worm. Neat. Which is kind of I very unusual, very true. unusual. <clears throat> and the same is true for trichinella, although I must say that trichinella destroys its cells as it attempts to maintain itself in the small intestine as the cells migrate up out of the crypts. You know, a normal migration is about seven days for each of the cells in the crypt. And trichinella adults are found at exactly the same place throughout its life. Right, and then eventually calcifies. Yeah. You know, I had one yep. of those sent in. The um, mm-hmm. They had done a hip resection, and they when they did the hip resection on this person, they took a bunch yeah. of the muscle and right. surrounding tissue, right. and lo and behold, there was a trichinella worm, but it was that? completely calcified. So, of course, they're asking me, what do we do? Do we need to treat them? <laughs> and I said, well... No, you don't need to treat them. Other, I would tell them to stop eating undercooked meat. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Too late. <laughs> yeah. Prevent reinfection. Too maybe. late. Right. But uh, for this infection, it's burned out. So right. Yeah. So one of the unusual, uh, I was one floor below our own pathology department here, and they sent down a specimen that they couldn't uh, identify right away. This was a gunshot wound, biopsied, resectioned, small, large intestine. Oh. All right. So that's the case history. It starts off with this guy was shot. He was a cab driver in New York City. He's only been here for three months. He was wounded, uh, and they fixed him up. I mean, he didn't die or anything. And his name was Ahmad Jamal. And I remember his name distinctly because before finding out the history, I thought it was the piano player, the jazz mm-hmm. piano player, oh. Ahmad Jamal. <laughs> and you'll never guess what they discovered on a biopsy, which I identified for them was a mated pair of schistosomes. Yeah. Oh, wow. And, uh, I've, <laughs> I've seen terrible. some of those on incidental <laughs> sections of bladders. Right, right. Yes, and it's the coolest thing. It is. Yeah, and of course, the schistosomes, they have that you know classic history where the male, sure. you've probably heard the hot dog in the bun yeah, analogy. Yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> you don't know if that's exactly. politically correct or not. But right. Yeah, the male forms the hot dog bun and the female right. the hot dog and That's they right. live together happily ever after. Although I've heard, and I don't know if this is true, I'd like yes. to see the research on this, but you know, the female leaves to go lay her eggs because ah. um, she has to get as close to the uh, venous plexus to right. the wall sure. as possible to make sure those eggs get into the tissue. Indeed. And then when she goes back... She usually goes back to the same male, but if there's another male that's closer, <laughs> she might go to him instead. Yeah, Whoever's, right. it's opportunistic. <laughs> Love Very the one you're with, right? Think so. That's right. So right, guess where right. the ta- <laughs> guess where the cab driver was from originally? Yemen. And he caught this infection in Yemen. Yemen. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Wow. Okay. Yeah. 
uh, it was great. Well, I mean, that's a really cool finding. I when was relieved. You, I'm sorry. When they brought it down to you, were they like into? Was it a histologic section? Yes, yes, yes. It was okay. an H and E, uh, and okay. they said there's something strange in this vanual. Can you tell yeah. us what you think <laughs> it is? And it was it was pretty easy to say because I'd oh, seen a lot really of them. Cool. Yeah, they they that's when they started to rely on me for lots of other things too. So I ended up giving them an annual um, histopathology quiz oh. called "Where Is Waldo?" Oh. And only only a portion of the slide that I would show had a parasite in it, and they got them right a lot of times. Mm. They were really pretty sharp people. Oh, that's really cool. So I had a lot of fun interacting with our pathology department. I teach a histopathology class to our fellows, oh, our great. microbiology fellows, nice. because that's not uncommon in the clinical microbiology lab. You know, pathologists up right. in surgical pathology, right. they don't like infectious things. No, they don't. <laughs> and they want to bring them to someone who can tell them that's what's right. that bacteria, right. what's that yeast, what's that fungus, what's sure. that parasite. And so I tell these people, even if they're not pathology trained, they need to know the basics to be able to help their colleagues. Right. Hmm. So, so uh, Bobby, yeah. I'll happily email you my PowerPoint presentation if you'd like it. Oh, that would be great. I'd love to see it. So maybe we can post that on the uh, show notes. Can I, have it, too. can I see it too? Sure, see it. sure. No, we will let a virologist look. No, we don't care. <laughs> <laughs> the next one is, a, is the Clonorchis. Chinese liver fluke, which we've talked about. We By the way, I don't know if you know this, Bobby, but on the first 25 episodes of TWIP, each one was about a different parasite with Dixon reaching back into his teaching years to describe each one. And way back, way Clonor back. And Clonarchus has a poem associated with it, oh, I like it. which is pretty funny. Yeah, this is great. So we will yep. uh, we'll put a we're going to put a permanent link to this in our show notes. Uh, oh, Dixon, that would at our, be excellent. At our website, and um, I think people will really like this. This is a lot of fun. Oh, good. Well, uh, there's some some fun videos in there. So yeah, this is great. Wanna, this is great. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask you. We had an email last week or last episode from Suzanne, who's one of our listeners in Texas, and. Um, she found lice in her children's hair and was mm. asking about, and and um, she she wanted to know if there was any relationship with having lice and being anemic. So uh, I guess this was we were talking about hookworms and and anemia, Dixon, right? And she's wondering yes. if people with anemia are, are less likely to have lice, I suppose, right? Mm. Well. If you have a very heavy louse infestation, you can become anemic because, mm. of course, the lice ingest blood. They feed on us. Sure. And uh, that's where the term lousy came from, lousy. Mm. It was lousy. You feel lousy um, because you would be partially anemic and kind of ill from the toxins in their saliva. I see. Yeah. Um so she says here, Google has links to a few cases where kids who were very infested showed up at hospitals with severe anemia that had no other oh. cause that doctors could find. There you yep. go. Yep. Yeah. This and, and the information about lice mentioned some people have asymptomatic mm. cases. Ev ev evidently, the itching is due to an allergy. So she asked, I'd love to know if anyone has studied how prevalent lice are in the U.S. Oh, God. Oh, boy. Like I don't everywhere. know. Um, <laughs> you know, it's not even a reportable disease. That's I think right. they're yeah, so common, right. just like yeah, pinworm. So we don't have the CDC keeping track of cases for us. That's right. I don't know if you want to go to case 300. If anyone's interested, I have a picture of head lice, and it was a really heavy <laughs> inf infestation. Wow. And um, essentially, it's one strand of hair that has, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight eggs goodness, from a goodness. louse, wow. a head louse on it. Wow. And this was addiction. actually an yeah, elderly yeah, man who was in a, a nursing home. Good so, goodness. My yeah, goodness. head lice can pass through schools and any kind of institution. So, really in case it, to shave it, your head, Dixon. <laughs> shave my head. Maybe just cut it off. <laughs> well, actually, our, our writer, our, our listener who wrote in said, yeah, my husband, husband shaves, shaves his, head. his head. That's right. And that's yeah. why a lot of people shave their pubises to get yeah. rid of the yeah. pubic lice. That's a different, is it the same louse? No, different? different, totally different. It's a different, different. louse. Mm. But that's why some people have hypothesized or speculated that um, the pubic louse is going to become extinct. Right. Because the Brazilian that's right. is, that's is right. in, on, in vogue right now. <laughs> but um, 
like I said, we still see cases, so I can't say that uh, sure. you know they're gone. So why do you think the head louse doesn't carry any disease whatsoever, and the body louse, which is almost indistinguishable in morphology, carries a very serious disease? And what is that, Dixon? I have no answer for that. I asked the question. And what's the disease that the body louse carries? Oh, epidemic typhus. Typhus, right. Yeah. Sure. Sure. You know, I'm not sure, but that's a really good question because some people have actually said the head louse and the body louse are really only differentiated wow. by one gene, which can be expressed and unexpressed. Very interesting. And yeah, if you put head lice and body lice will mate in a laboratory condition. Really? So hmm. I can't answer that. I, I would say I bet you that they are capable of carrying it. It's just I bet it's more... Um, the environment when you have body lice hmm. it's usually you know homelessness or war and famine war. and that's then right. that's also a, an awful condition for all sorts of diseases sure whereas children with head lice they're usually healthy and they're in a relatively healthy yep. environment yep. i don't know if they could I, I would guess that head lice can carry organisms they just probably aren't exposed to them maybe could uh, be. maybe you'll have to uh, find out and <laughs> post someone it on should your next yeah. Someone should take head lice and just deep sequence them and see what kind of organisms are in them. I'm sure they have a microbiome, you know. Oh, yeah. Oh, sure. And I bet they have viruses, too. Of course. Mm -hmm. um, that would be an interesting – someone must be doing it, I'm sure. You think? Yeah. <laughs> so we got one email in the past week in response to this question about lice and iron. Let me just read that as our last one. And this is from David. All I remember is that one time I let my cat endure a heavy flea infestation for an unconscious, unconscionably long time. I redeemed myself, if at all, by the knowledge that I slept with her a lot and so endured a share myself. <laughs> but I'm extraordinary thick-skinned, so it wasn't bad, and I didn't get plague. <laughs> anyway, the, the situation's gravity was brought home to me when I discovered that she was significantly anemic. Clearing the fleas and maintaining her freedom from parasites of any kind found the anemia gone and blood restored to a normal HCT HGB after a few months. In other words, the insects consumed a significant quantity of blood. Lice aren't fleas, of course, and people are bigger than cats, so I don't know if the lady who corresponded with you about her and her daughter's lice and her long-standing iron supplementation will have her case at all illuminated by my anecdote, but I do know that fleas can drain a consequential amount of blood from some of us. What do you think? So, so uh, Bobby sure. has just told us that yeah. lice can certainly yeah. do that. Yeah, yeah. they're blood-sucking ectoparasites. That they are. Uh, so actually, as Suzanne had talked about, she, she was taking iron supplements, and she wondered whether um, that, that could influence getting lice or not. If you have a lot of iron, maybe you get more lice, right? I don't know. I don't know about happier. that. they're yeah. happier. Right. <laughs> Anyway, there was well, an interesting correlation, though, with another parasite, and that was with uh, malaria. Um, when Bangladesh became a country, I think I must have mentioned this, but I'll just repeat it for um, maybe Bobby, Bobby's um, um, not edification, of course, but just for to yeah, add, just, it, add it to your story list. Sure. Um, when the WHO went into Bangladesh to discover a huge um, epidemic of anemia. They made a suggestion, and that is that they should give out iron supplements to everybody. That was their mm. number one recommendation. And it was largely due to hookworm disease that they were suffering from, mm. as they determined. But uh, a subtext was, of course, the fact that they were also suffering from malaria. But the malaria wasn't doing very well because the patients were anemic. So oh. they, were, they weren't actually suffering from malaria. Uh. The moment they gave them the iron supplement, mm. do you know got what happened? They got malaria. Three million children died. Wow. Oh, Three wow. million children died. Wow. You know, there's and so many times we try to do good and exactly. Exactly. Don't understand right. the biology completely nope. and we Yep, and just like building all those dams in here, Africa here, here, here. and and caused schistosomiasis to become rampant. That's right. Well, I think it's time for us to wrap this up. Bobby needs to go in a few minutes. Yeah. And um, what a I, pleasure, by the way. I, 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 think, yeah, Bobby Pritt is at the Mayo Clinic, and you can find creepy, dreadful, wonderful parasites at parasitewonders.blogspot.com. Thank you so much, Bobby. It was great. Thank you. It's been a lot of fun. Hope you come back sometime. I'd love to. Thanks. Thank you. Great. Um, Dixon de Pommier can be found at many places verticalfarm.com, urbanag.ws, trichinella.org, medicalecology.com. My goodness. Did I miss something? <laughs> no one can find me. <laughs> Just search for Dixon de Pommier. Thank you, Dixon. My pleasure, of course. 
And I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. You've been listening to This Week in Parasitism. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back soon. Another twip is parasitic. parasitic.